From the Psych Hub Podcast Network, welcome to Coming Back Better, a podcast sponsored by HCA Healthcare and in collaboration with Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. Today's podcast does include the discussion about death and loss and grief, and we want to recognize that that can be difficult at times. And so we respect your choice as far as taking breaks or perhaps choosing not to listen to today's podcast. Thank you. Breaking news for our viewers in the West, a stunning report just out. It shows a record shattering 6.6 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits. How do you grieve when bedside visits and funerals are banned? All these losses, big or small, have people grieving, but even our ability to grieve has changed during the pandemic. Hi, everybody. I'm Marjorie Morrison. And I'm Paul Dager. Welcome back to Coming Back Better. I'm here with my co-host, Paul, and this week we're going to focus on a really tough subject of grief and loss, and what happened during the pandemic and how we can come out of it. Yeah, Marjorie, I'm really glad we're spending some time speaking to this because grief and loss is always part of the human experience, but COVID was something different. We look at some of these numbers about just the magnitude of grief and loss. It's hard to imagine that we have lost over 800,000 people in the United States to COVID-19. It's, it's profound. Yeah, and for every one of those people gone, how many other lives have been touched? Speaking from personal experience about that today, that it's just an unbelievable number of people who lives have been changed in so many ways. Yeah, and I appreciate, Paul, you've been through so much yourself. So I really appreciate that your willingness to share your own personal experience This is something that it really has affected all of us. We all have this collective experience. I was just reading about a CDC survey released in August that over 26,000 public health workers found that 53%, 53%, more than half, reported symptoms of depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, or PTSD. That means that we all have experienced so much grief and loss in so many different ways, whether it was missing graduations, missing life events, missing big birthday celebrations, or losing opportunities to advance with jobs, or just worrying about your own health and that fear, that constant fear. It's really done a lot on all of us. We can all relate. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this episode and for our listeners to learn from you, Paul, and everything that goes along with it. Thanks, Marjorie. You know, that collective idea of, yeah, we all went through this together and all had our own versions of it. And I have to admit, maybe it's my optimistic side or my therapist side that wants to look for the growth opportunities here. But let's not rush ahead. Let's make sure we uh, honor this topic fully. Paul, you especially have been through a lot. And I'd love for you to kind of just share some of that background with us. Yeah. Thanks, Marjorie. I consider it a sacred gift in a way to be able to offer this story. And back in 2020, I actually experienced the loss of two brothers. And one was COVID-related and one wasn't. The first brother was some health issues. And it was we found out after the fact that we had lost him because he was a bit isolated from the family. It was back in the Chicago area where my mother was, my elderly mother. And my sister and I made quite the uh, case management team. So once we got word, we swooped into town and really tried to figure out what had happened. And then a lot of it was taking care of my mother at the time. who was elderly with early dementia, living in assisted living. And during COVID, we had to get special permission to go in to talk to her and, and tell her one of her children was gone. Wow. And we had to do the full garb. And I just, I, it's coming wow. back to me now. I mean, head to toe, you had to be covered up. And going into her room and, and sharing with her the loss of a son, I think in some ways that was harder than the loss I experienced, just to see her, her lose one of her five kiddos. So there was a lot of sort of case management things to do that my sister and I had to jump in and take care of to sort of wrap up my brother's life. And I think that's one of my coping mechanisms is to be able to do something. And so coming from a healthcare background, case management, that's where I think I put a lot of early focus is there are things that have to get done. So my sister and I are going to do them. And that was in July of 2020. So we came back to Denver, got back to our lives here and We had another brother living in a nursing home from a series of strokes. He had gotten COVID once and we thought we were going to lose him and he bounced back. So there was the joy and the relief of, okay, he made it through. And then still not clear if he got it again or maybe it never fully cleared. But the second bout, 
this was early in COVID and it was, we were starting to learn not just a respiratory disease, but that it affects everything in the body and his brain was severely affected. So there was some recovery physically, but he was a different person, which was, I think was the hardest part. And again, due to COVID in the nursing home, very limited opportunity to see him. And so we had to do the full garb, head to toe, put everything on. With him, I got to spend five minutes because of COVID restrictions. And the hard part was, it was not my brother anymore. And so felt an obligation to be bedside. And yet there was really no way to offer him any kind of comfort because he, his brain had changed so much at that point. So we brought in hospice and a few days later, because of not eating, he had finally passed. And again, it was having to go back to my mother, now with three remaining siblings, and um, share with her that she had lost the second son within what, three months. And again, I think that was the hardest part. My own grief is one thing. I can manage through that, but to deliver that news to her, I think was the hardest part. Again, there was the case management stuff. My sister and I had to take care of what do you do after you lose someone? There were things dealing with the nursing home as well. So it was a very different experience than the first brother. And then we came back to our lives back in Denver. They were similar in the sense that both of them were out of town. We had to sort of swoop in, take care of things, support my mom, and then come back to our lives in Denver. When I first offered to share my story, that was my grief story to share. But I do feel I can't leave out now a couple months ago, having experienced three more deaths. And so I'm in this place of, there's the different stages, I guess, between the five different deaths, the, the two in 2020 and the three this year. I tend to be naturally reflective. So I've been in this space of, what does this mean? And, and what do I need to do for myself? And then my wife and my son, they have been touched by all of this as well. So yeah, there's been a lot of pausing and reflecting. And so I thought to share my story, if there's anyone else out there who is struggling or trying to figure things out, if my experience and my pain can bring something to them, then I'm all for it. So I, I'm, I'm willing to you know, be of service to the folks out there listening. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing all of this. How does one handle it? Like, how do you process all of this? I've learned recently more about post-traumatic stress disorder. And the people who do fight or flight are less likely to have trauma symptoms than those who freeze. And that really touched something in me because I tend to be a doer when during the acute experience of, of death and loss, that doing something feels better is kind of a weird term. It helps me. When I can't do something, that's the hardest. One of the recent deaths was an old dear friend who lived in another state and there was nothing for, no action for me to take. That hit really hard. So I think, at least for me, if I can take some kind of action, that begins the healing process. The other thing that I've found, and this was actually a sweet memory. So the second brother, he was a big cross-country skier and his wish was to have his ashes put out on this famous cross-country ski event called the Berkey. And so my sister and I, trained for a year and we got all the gear and we went out in the cold of Northern Wisconsin in February of this year. And, and to me, there's a doing in that sense of sort of a, a ritual, an act that I can take to honor the person who's gone and honor my pain with that experience. So the first thing that comes to mind is for me to process something, there needs to be a doing component that helps to, to bring some movement. And sometimes doing can be um, resisting and denying, but for me, it's usually more thoughtful for, than that. It's this way of connecting to the experience and hopefully moving through it. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your story with us. I recently had a conversation with Dr. Kathy Shear about this topic. I'd love to share it with you and our audience. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shear is the Marion E. Kenworthy Professor of Psychiatry and the founding director of the Center for Complicated Grief at Columbia University School of Social Work. It really sounds like we can learn a great deal from her. So let's take a listen. Dr. Shear, welcome. Thank you, Marjorie, and thank you so much for having me. Dr. Shear, can you help us understand what is grief and then kind of what are some of the types of grief that people are experiencing post-COVID? So grief can be defined very simply as the response to loss, but it's anything but a simple experience. 
the way we experience grief is a collection of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, along with, for many of us, a spiritual response. If we have a sense of spirituality, grief is going to connect with that. And physical reactions we also have. And social, it changes our social reactions is also, that's kind of a form of behavior. And so that's what grief is writ large. The other thing about grief is that each person experiences it in their own way. And not only each person, but each loss is experienced in a in a unique way. Grief can be thought of in this very big picture way, but if you want to understand individuals' grief, it's going to be very unique to them and to what or who they lost. Can you talk a little bit about grief in COVID? In COVID, we lost, at least temporarily, we lost a lot of things. And also we lost some things permanently. And we grieve the loss of anything that we really care about that we care deeply about. I think the hallmark of grief is yearning and longing and sort of preoccupying thoughts or strong thoughts and memories of the person we lost or whatever it is we've lost. How we manage those, how we cope with those feelings is variable and depends on what we've lost. So if you've lost your job, for example, how much you're going to grieve and what form your grief is going to take depends on what your job meant to you. But we are grieving those kinds of losses. Can you share some statistics about how many people have experienced grief, loss of life, any to kind of set the stage of the sort of severity of this? The best estimate that we have from the sort of scientific perspective is that there are roughly nine people on average bereaved for every person who dies. So that gets us up into probably close to 10 million people, the loss of someone from COVID. And then there's also the losses that occurred during COVID, which were not reduced. So there are approximately 2.8 million people die every year, just of various causes in this country. So you would add those together. So we have a lot of people who are grieving the loss of a loved one who they lost during COVID. Can you help us understand Why do humans actually experience grief? Well, in the words of C.S. Lewis, bereavement and grief are not a truncation of the experience of love, but rather a continuation of that process. So you can think of grief as being the continuation of love after we lose the person that we love. It is the way that we continue our relationship after someone dies. And so immediately after they die, the way we continue that relationship is to look for them, to search for them, to be, to have our mind filled with thoughts and memories and feelings about them and wanting them back. But as time goes on, we usually start to come to terms with the fact that they're gone and sort of, we don't stop grieving per se, if we define grief as the response to loss, the loss is permanent. So we have a response to it. We don't forget the person. We don't stop caring about them, but the form that that takes changes a lot. So as we adapt, and that's what's key here, because we we have to adapt to all the changes in our lives that come about as a consequence of the loss. Is there like a right way to grieve? There's no right way to grieve. There's no right way to love. Is there is there a right way to love? I don't think so. Great answer. Are there some ways that people will deal with it that are better than others? The way that I like to think about this, there's a a whole interesting line of research into what's called the adaptive unconscious. And it's a part of our brain that helps us basically adapt to change, basically. So this can be simple physical change. You You move somewhere, you're pretty disoriented for a while, and then gradually you start to feel more comfortable in that space. And you're not exactly doing anything to, to make that change. Your brain is kind of reorienting itself to this new environment. And it does that also after a social loss, you know, after the loss of someone close, which is probably the most profound thing we can experience, a profound kind of change we can experience, certainly one of them. It's so interesting and it's so fascinating. I think so much of it is because we all can relate. I mean, everybody goes through it at some time in their life. How can we help someone, someone we care for, or even just, you know, a colleague or a friend or a family is grieving? Is there anything that we can, any tips for us? 
in a way, the main thing, the paradoxical thing, of course, you want to help someone who's grieving a lot, but the main thing is to try not to try too hard to help them. In other words, you can't really change that situation. And that really is the thing that people feel is that that's what they really need is to have the person back and nothing else is going to help. And if you try to make too many suggestions or try too hard, it, it, it's very off-putting. So really being a good listener, being available, not expecting your friend or family member to be there for you in the same way that they usually are. And letting that process, letting both of those processes unfold in whatever way they are with the person you're trying to help. Makes a lot of sense. Does grief end or is it something that we always struggle with? It doesn't end, but it does change and evolve into something that's much more manageable. The thing that's difficult about it is that years later, you can have a life event, you can be in a phase of your life, it can be a family holiday or something like that, and all of a sudden you're feeling it really strongly again. It does subside. It kind of gets activated and then it recedes. So we don't say that it's really not over per se. There can be a lot of different kinds of triggers and, and sometimes it can really just seem like it comes out of the blue. What about different types of grief? Like, is it different to grieve a person or an animal or you lost your home in a fire? Is there you know, a difference with those kinds of things? Grief is it's unique to every person in every loss. So it is going to be different, but it also has some commonalities. It's like, if you look at it from 30,000 feet, there are a lot of similarities in, in grief over these different things. But if you look at it on the ground, it looks very different because it's very different to lose your house than it is to lose the person that you love the most in your life. So those five stages of grief are really for someone who is dying and is coming to terms with their life, not so much the person that's grieving them, and then what you're doing is you're focused on the people with your complicated and prolonged grief is the person who is dealing with it. And it's really important that we separate that. That's a really important differentiation. With the stages, I think if I recall denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. How about prolonged grief? What would be, yeah, I guess if you can help us understand what those stages might be like. So we think of what you have to do as more fluid What we're going to do to adapt to a loss is we're going to accept the reality of what's happened, which means we're going to accept the fact that this person is gone and they're not coming back, the finality of the loss. And the permanence of grief in our life, we're going to accept grief into our life. We're not going to try to get over it or get rid of it or get past it or anything like that. We're going to let it come and let it be, manage, of course, the emotional activation that goes along with it. We have to manage that, but that emotional activation is going to gradually subside over time. What we have to do is we have to accept the reality, and then we also have to restore our capacity for well-being because losing someone close will undermine that. They're not stages in the sense that we think of stages as being like one to then there's another, right. But we do talk about healing milestones as a way of kind of thinking about what you do to adapt. And there are seven of those, or really six, I guess, because there's understanding and accepting grief and managing grief-related emotions, both the painful emotions, but also the positive emotions. So understanding and accepting grief is one. The second one is being able to see the future as holding some promise of happiness, of joy and satisfaction. The third one is strengthening relationships with people who are still alive. The fourth one is being able to narrate the story of the death, narrating meaning, tell it in a way that has meaning. And the fifth one is to learn learn to live with the reminders, those things that can really activate grief, but the reminders of the, that the person is gone that are very painful for many people. And the last one is to be able to feel connected with the person who died, to feel the connection, the ongoing connection, because we know we, we have that ongoing connection in our brain. People we love are literally mapped in our brains. 
we almost validate grief when someone, when we lose someone and someone dies, we expect grief, but maybe there's some shame or embarrassment about some grief about things or situations that have profound impact, but at the same time, maybe not as significant as, you know, it's easier to blame someone, I guess, if there's a breakup and someone didn't want it, it's like, well, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. I really like that because I think that's so true. And, you know, it becomes true of grief too. When people grieve too long, then you get that same reaction, but you're right. People don't expect it in these other situations. And we do grieve the loss of anything that's really important to us or anyone. And however we lose them, we grieve, which means we yearn and long and we're preoccupied and we have to find our way forward. We have to accept the new reality. And that's not easy to do. We resist that, naturally resist it because we want the old reality. The one missing piece I would say that to this discussion is the idea of what we now call sort of natural defensive responses that we all have, which include the sense of disbelief, the protest, the counterfactual thinking, which is basically the if only kind of thinking, the woulda, coulda, shoulda thinking, the self-blame and anger that goes, that we often feel, um, the sense of not knowing sort of who we are, loss of a sense of identity, loss of a sense of connection to other people, and a big one is to want to avoid things that that remind us of the loss that activate the grief even more. And these are all very natural kinds of responses and also not wanting to think about the future at all. So we're all going to do that, or most people are going to do that early on. But when any of those kinds of, you can think of them as ways to kind of ward off this painful reality to get it away from you. And if you try too hard to do that, if you've if you focus all your kind of adapting and coping on any of those, that gets in the way of your ability to really come to terms with the loss and move forward in your life. Wow, Marjorie, thank you for, for speaking with, with Dr. Shear. And I, the whole time, I'm just so many points that I can relate to from that conversation. I've heard this definition before that grief is the continuation of love. And that just, my heart just was so touched by that. You don't feel the loss unless there was love there to begin with. It's such a complicated process and so different for everybody. It happens so unconscious what the brain does. Yeah, there's this, feels like there's a a protective aspect that our brain, our mind's going to take care of us if we can sort of get out of the way and, and let let that happen. And not that it's easier, but I find that sometimes when I've been in my own healing process, that the less I do, the better. That is interesting. But when you say the less you do, do you mean like to be thinking about the grief, to try to, what does that actually mean for you? It's funny because now I'm thinking about different phases. Like early on, I want to do something. Give me something to do so I can <laughs> feel, <Right. laughs> you know, feel better, feel productive. But what I find later on, it's more so these moments of quiet and I start to find a sweetness. You know, when I think back to some of these folks that I've lost and there'll be something in my environment that reminds me of them. Sweetness is the quality that, that I feel. And I can't make that happen. It, in a sense, it has to come to me. And then it's just up to me to let it be there and just almost like laying back in water, just kind of lay back and and immerse myself in the sweetness of that memory. I love that. It's almost like someone can continue to live with you, even though they're no longer with us. It's like you can kind of carry them in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Nicely put. They're still with me in a different way. From that cross country ski race, there's big old cowbells that people ring to keep you going on the race course because it's like a six hour race in freezing cold Northern Wisconsin. My brother had a cowbell that I brought home and then I bought one for myself and the two are on the shelf. And so these touch points reinforce that sweetness for me. Part of what I studied in school was about ritual and the importance of that. And I find that I naturally do that. I I create these little rituals in my life. It's not about staying stuck in the pain. It's about where am I now relative to this? 
And again, I can't force that. I find sometimes I just have to let it be and kind of ride the wave. It's so interesting to hear about the healing milestones, right? And that kind of how that old expression, time heals all wounds. Not just time though, it's what what do I do with that time? And finding that, I mean, there's certain necessities. You just got to go on with life. There are things, you know, especially I have a son on the autism spectrum and there's a lot of work in parenting him. And so sometimes my wife and I are just recognizing right now we got to just deal with what's in front of us. And I think part of that is when you have this grief, there are times where it just has to take a second seat because there's just, there's stuff that has to get done and recognizing that you've got to then make space for it later on. So I think that time element is there's, time and what do I do with that time? And also it's, we're talking about lives that are no longer with us, but grief we discussed, it's so complicated because you can grieve a situation. I mean, divorce rates post COVID are so high and grieve a a family that you used to have or a relationship that you used to be in that, you know, has ended since or The aftermath of grief affects us in so many ways. Just even just a a situation that we liked that's no longer there, or even a situation that's complicated can be complicated grief. Yeah, I'm hearing a certain who am I coming from what you're saying. And who am I when this person is not actively in my life anymore? Who am I if I don't have this job anymore or this particular role? I guess depending upon what you built who am I on, it can get really scary if that foundation is getting taken away or does it turn into, well, this is time for me to to shed whatever definition I had and find the new one. Not that that's easy. I, I just tend to be naturally reflective. So I find that serves me well. But then there's sometimes like, I want nothing to do with this right now. This is too much work. So I think that's a part of like with time, just going with what does this moment call for? Do I want to dive in deep or... I just want a break. I want you know Netflix and stream and or go go up to a mountaintop. It's honoring that is going to constantly shift. What do I need right now? I really appreciate that. What would you say were some of your best takeaways from the conversation with Dr. Shear? The definition of grief, and then this sense of, in a way, our minds are really evolved to be adaptive. When something feels really difficult and hard we actually have resiliency within us that is usually greater than we give it credit for. And that's what I'm hearing in her research on grief, that we may be stronger than we think. And we are. We always are stronger than we think. Marjorie, that was really well stated. I could not agree more. And for next week, our topic is going to be burnout. And recognize that burnout is something that's been around longer than COVID, but we take a look at really the influence COVID had on the brewing of burnout that was already present. So please join us next week to explore that topic. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so at podcast at scihub.com. To be notified of new episodes, don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening. And reviews are so helpful, so please do leave one if you can. It will allow others to find us and join along. Coming Back Better is executive produced by Jacob Morrison. It is produced and edited by Juliana Castro. The series was developed in collaboration with Linda Rosenberg, Carla Cantor, and Kristen Watson from Columbia University Department of Psychiatry, and Manisha Shah, Dr. Frank Drummond, and Amy Rushton from HCA Healthcare. Research is assisted by Melissa Leith. Show artwork was created by Arnella Jangoli and Ashton Smith. Audience strategy is by Alyssa Fackler, Sarah Hale, and Alyssa Yarama. A very special thanks to Andrea Rollback, Trevin Stagall, Evelyn Valentine, Kaylee Sneed, Julie Plummer, Thad Thomas, Paul Kay, and Elizabeth Roosevelt. Coming Back Better is a co-production from PsychHub and Columbia University Department of Psychiatry and is brought to you by HCA Healthcare. I'm Paul Dager and my co-host Marjorie Morrison and I thank you for joining us. See you next week.